Our reading today is from Habakkuk chapter 3. I pray the prayer of the prophet Habakkuk according to... I can't say this other word, sorry. Lord, I have heard the report about you. Lord, I stand in O of your deeds. Revive your work in these years. Make it known in these years is in your work. Remember mercy. God, God comes to Timon, the Holy One, from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His experience is like light rose flashing from his hand. There is where his power is hidden. Plague goes before him, and pestilence falls in his steps. He stands and shakes the earth. He looks and suffers the nations. The aged old mountains break apart. The ancient hills sink down. His pathways are ancient. I see the tents of creation in distress, the tent curtains of the land, and Midian tremble. Are you hungry at the rivers, Lord? Is your wrath against the rivers? Is it your rage against the sea? When you ride on your horses, your victorious chariot, you took the sheath from your bow, the arrows are ready to be used with an oath. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains see you shudder. A damp power of water sweeps by. The deep roars with its voice and lifts its waves high. Sun moon, and moon stand still in their lofty residence. At the flash of your flying arrows, at the brightness of your shining spear, you march across the earth with indignation. You trample down the nations in wrath. You come out to save your people, to save the, your anointed. You crush the leader of the house of the wicked and strip from foot and neck. You pierce his head with his own spears. His warriors storm out to scatter us. Everyone passes by the scoffs and shakes. Oh, I read the wrong one. I think I. Oh, I read the wrong one. This is a new Bible. The pages still stick, so. Yeah. Oh, gloating as is ready to secretly devour the weak. You tread the tree with your horses, stirring up the vast water. I heard you and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness enters my bones. I trembled where I stood. Now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people, invading us. Said the fig tree that does not bud, and there is no fruit on the vines. <coughs> the earth's crop fails, and the fields produce no food. Through the flocks disappear from the pen, and there are no herds in the stores. Yet I will celebrate the Lord, I will rejoice in the Lord of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountains height for the choir director and stringed instruments. Thanks for the reading today. So this is obviously a, um, a lengthier passage at the end of the book of uh, Habakkuk and um, it, it, I guess it causes us to think a little bit about what the point is of including all the history books in the Old Testament in the Bible. I mean, what's the point of uh, a passage like this to us today? Habakkuk is, uh, the, the time of Habakkuk is long past, and in many ways we are essentially 
New Testament Christians, aren't we? I mean, what's the core of our faith? The, the, uh, the point is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who was born of the Virgin Mary, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, you know, he was crucified, he took God's wrath for our sins on him, and he died and was rejected by God. And in so doing, he makes us clean. Our sins are washed away. And now, out of thankfulness to that, we live in response to that. And then the New Testament letters tell us how we might do that. All these things are described in the New Testament. So why does our Bible contain stories like this in the Old Testament in them? Why do we have uh, the prayers of the prophet Habakkuk included for us? I think one of the reasons is that, uh, there are many reasons, but one of the reasons is that God teaches us about who he is. One of the key things that the Old Testament teaches us that is that God is gracious, that he's loving, that he's faithful to his promises. And the prophet Habakkuk, the story that we have recorded here, is one of those places where we learn about God's holiness, about his faithfulness, and also about his justice. So let's just uh, ground ourselves and think about where we are in the Bible. Now, um, last week I was away on leave, but the week before that, we saw how Habakkuk had come to God to complain. He was, it was kind of going crazy because he saw how uh, it, there was all this injustice in Israel. The leaders of Israel were doing all kinds of wrong things, and so Habakkuk takes his prayer to God and says, you should do something about this. And then God says to him, I will do something about this. I will say the Babylonians, these people that are far worse than Israel, to come and kind of bring Israel to heal, to change their hearts, to bring them back to him. And then Habakkuk loses his mind and he says to God, how can you possibly use people that are so much worse than the Jews to bring the Jewish nation back to you? He cries out that God should give him an answer. And what happens in chapter 2, which we haven't read, is that God responds to Habakkuk. And in this, he answers all the questions that Habakkuk uh, gives uh, by pronouncing these five different woes on different kinds of people. Now, a woe is a way of saying, basically, you are cursed by God. It's, if you are under woe, it's a bad thing for you because God is saying that these people are uh, evil or so. And he says, woe to the person who is greedy, who steals and doesn't take what is his. Woe to the person who makes money dishonestly, who extorts people. Woe to the people who exploit people, who commit injustice. Woe to the nation who causes the nation around them, the nations around them to commit sin. And woe to the person who bows down to a false idol and worships a different god. Now, in responding to Habakkuk, God pronounces these woes, and, and he is essentially saying, this is what Israel has become. They have become a people who take what is not theirs, who are greedy, who are dishonest with money, who exploits, they become a nation who exploit people. They have become a nation that causes the nations around them to sin as they worship these other gods. God, in effect, says that Judah, the nation of Israel, what was left is, is the tribe of Judah, Judah is cursed because every woe that he has pronounced characterizes the people of Judah. They were meant to be a nation that was to show the world around them what a blessing it is to live under God's law. But now God says, instead of being a light to the nations, you've actually caused the nations around you to sin even more. And so because of that, Judah now has utterly failed to be who they were meant to be. And in effect, God says, my patience has run out. Now there is a lesson for us here, individually and for a church as a whole. At the very least, we need to consider this. You know, in, in large part, the church has replaced Israel as God's message to the world, hasn't it? We are the people who are supposed to shine the light of Jesus to the world. We're supposed to show the world what it is to be God's people, how great it is to live under his rule. God's message to the world comes through the church. 
And we are supposed to be the ones that say, come and bow down to Jesus, put your faith in him, because look how great it is, you will finally find that missing piece of you. But is that true of us individually? Is that true of our lives and the way we live? Is that true of us corporately as a local body of the church? Is that true of the church more broadly in the world? Has not the church perhaps dragged God's name through the mud? Is that not what you know the, the child abuse scandals of the last sort of decade has done? Is not the church globally, uh, you know, rightfully accused of, of being greedy, of dishonest gain, of bowing down to these false idols while pretending to worship God? Is that not what the prosperity gospel does? Individually, we need to consider whether the message that we are spreading, the reputation we give God as we live, actually is a good one. Friends, have you considered what, your repu what reputation your life and action gives to the gospel? Now in Israel's history, at this stage, God has essentially had enough with his people. It's been a thousand years that they've been a kingdom uh, of, of, of his people and continually they have rejected him. And so at this point, God's patience has run dry and Babylon is on its way. Judah is about to be destroyed and there is nothing that Habakkuk the prophet can do. The die is cast. Nothing can be changed. Babylon is on its way and nothing can be done. Now sometimes we find ourselves in situations like that, don't we? Is this not a universal human experience where we know that the worst is about to happen? And there is nothing you can do about it. It's that moment where you have gone on your bike, you've come down the hill at full speed, at the jump, you've hit the jump, and as you launch into the air, you realize that the angle is all wrong. You're in the air, you know in that split second, you come to realize you know, three fundamental truths at the exact same time. One is this is going to hurt. Two is there's nothing I can do about it. And three is I shouldn't have done this in the first place. It's that moment when you are uh, being called into the principal's office, you know, something you did earlier that day has been discovered and your year level coordinator is there next to you and you can't run away and the only option is to get up from your desk, to walk down the corridor of shame and to go sit down next to the office door. It's the moment between knowing you've been caught, knowing what the outcome is going to be, but before the guillotine falls. That is Habakkuk's case. He didn't personally do anything wrong. He isn't the one who's corrupted Israel over a thousand years. But uh, the fact is, he's the one who's actually called out to God to complain about the injustice and the wickedness that's happened in Israel and in Judah. But God says, reveals to him that Babylon is on the way and there's nothing he can do about it. The reckoning had come. What do we do in that space? Where our life is derailed, the reckoning is coming and we cannot stop it, how do we respond? Habakkuk responds in a way that is utterly, astoundingly surprising. And we have to consider what he does. Now imagine the scene. He's sort of standing on the metaphorical walls of Jerusalem watching the army in the horizon, you know, the big dust cloud is coming as they travel. He knows Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. He knows that God's people is about to be taken, are about to be taken off into exile. And if that was you, how would you react? I think most of us would probably run away. We find the nearest exit, we get out of there, and we save ourselves. But what Habakkuk does is so completely countercultural that we have to think about it because it challenges us in a very deep way. So what does he do when, the, when he knows the reckoning is coming? He does two things. He gives praise in the reckoning and he shows his faith during the reckoning. So let's have a look at these two things. Praise in the reckoning. 
Now all of verse 1 to 15 is, is this massive, beautiful poem that Habakkuk has written to praise God. Now remember, the army is on the way. The city is about to fall. Habakkuk might even be standing on the walls watching them approach and instead of running, he decides to write a poem, maybe it's a song, that declares God's glory. He praises God. He says things like, his splendor is over all the earth. His brilliance is like light. He's, he's got these rays flashing from his hand. Where he walks, the very earth quakes. Mountains split apart before God. The, even the hills want to hide it from his presence because he's so holy. The rivers uh, rend the earth. The mountains see him and they squirm and quiver. Do you know anyone who can make a mountain squirm? Habakkuk is, in, is proclaiming God's greatness. His glory is so big in Habakkuk's eye that he can't help but praise God. He says, when God goes by, the sun and the moon, the heavenly bodies, they stand still. They wait for him to pass. And then he makes several statements about God's justice, about how God brings renewal for the sake of his appointed people. He describes God's glory in terrific detail. And that's great, but why? Why does Habakkuk respond to do like, like that? Why does he choose that moment to praise God? He could have gone and found a way out, but why now? I think it's because Habakkuk understood something in the middle of the reckoning that we need to remember. Habakkuk knew that God was a faithful God. That God was faithful even in the reckoning, even when his life was falling apart, when the city is about to be destroyed, even when the enemy is on the horizon, even when Jerusalem's about to collapse, when his world's about to end, God is faithful. God remains faithful even during the apocalypse. And because God remains God even in the apocalypse, God deserves our worship even in the apocalypse. Because God is still God when the reckoning comes, God deserves our praise in the middle of the reckoning. And because God is still faithful when the walls of the city are being scaled by the invaders who have come, the right response we have before God is still the same. To praise Him for who He is, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. Now we've all seen these apocalyptic movies, haven't we? Where the meteor is hurtling down to earth, you know, the, the army's done everything they can, they've flown nuclear warheads, tried to blast it out of the sky, nothing's working. And the, 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 <coughs> the meteor just keeps coming, and the earth is like, you know, 10 hours away from being destroyed, it's about to be wiped out, and so the news tells everyone, you know, this is going to happen. And because our culture is shaped by Hollywood, what happens and what we think the right thing to do is that we respond in one of three ways. First thing people in these movies do, and probably what many of us would do, is we run to our loved ones. We race home to kiss or hug or whatever the person for the last time, right? That's response one. The second thing people do is they go to the abandoned grocery stores. They, they run, they, they go to David Jones, the luxury store, they finally get to have those pair of shoes they've wanted for ages, um, and they loot as much as they can. They want the feeling of being rich just for a while. And the third thing they do is they do the things that they would never do. They go and... Um, you know, go skydiving, jump off a cliff, they, or they run to their secret crush and declare their love for them, they punch the bully in the nose, you know, the sorts of things that you would never normally do. Because the reckoning, the apocalypse, the, when our life falls around, it has a way of crystallizing our deepest held beliefs. It has a way of showing us what really lives down deep in our hearts, what the things are that we really, really want. It has a way of showing us, in fact, who our real God actually is. It has a way of showing us who we really worship. And so for Habakkuk, when the reckoning comes, when the apocalypse dawns, if you like, he doesn't do any of those things. 
He is out there praising God, declaring God's greatness, even as his life falls apart. And that is so challenging for us, isn't it? And I think this forces us to honestly ask ourselves, is this how I would respond? Is this really what lives down deep in my heart? Praising God in the middle of the storm? So how does he do that? How do we, how do we get to be like him? How does our heart change so that when the apocalypse comes, when the reckoning comes, we actually respond like he does? Where does he get that conviction from? How is it that he can be so different? Well, friends, it's because he has met the one who is sending the reckoning. We've seen how the reckoning is coming. We've seen how Habakkuk responds by praising God. Now we, we, we can look at how he responds in faith because he's met the one who sends the reckoning. I want to read here um, this remarkable statement of faith that he makes in verse 16. He says, I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. So now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there's no fruit on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stores, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in, God of my, uh, in, in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and he enables me to walk on mountain heights. How is it that Habakkuk can make this incredible statement of faith when there is no food, when the fig tree is dead, when the crops fail, when the fields don't make food, when the flocks are gone, how is it that he can say, even then I will celebrate in the Lord, in the God who is my salvation? How can he say that? Well, it's because of what, he, what happens to him in verse 2. Right back in verse 2, he says, you know, previously I have heard a report about you, Lord. He heard about what God has done. But now he has met God, he has interacted with God, God has revealed himself to him and he says something very similar to what Job says in the book of Job. I had heard a report about you but now my eyes have seen you, therefore I repent in dust and ashes. The same thing happens to Habakkuk. I heard, I trembled, I quivered at the sound and it felt like my bones were rotting, I trembled where I stood. That's what happens when we meet the Lord. It changes us on the inside. Habakkuk can make this incredible statement of faith when the world is falling apart because God has met with him. Habakkuk has beheld God face to face. He has a personal relationship with God. And he says, because of that, God is his salvation. But he says that even though he knows he's about to enter into this period of disaster. He knows the day of disaster is coming for him. So the salvation he talks about is not that God would somehow change his mind and quickly chase Babylon away. He knows Jerusalem is about to destroy it. At best for him, what he can hope for is being carried off into exile. At worst, he will be killed. And still he calls God his salvation. He is pointing us to a greater reality that we share. A reality that transcends the time in which Habakkuk was living. He's pointing us to the salvation, friends, we have in Jesus Christ. You see, when we are Christians, when we believe in Jesus, when we believe what we started the sermon with, you know, that he lived for us, that he died for us, that he took our sins on his shoulders, that he paid fully for all of that, and that because of that we are made right with God, we can say with Habakkuk that God is our salvation through Christ the Son. And unlike Habakkuk, who could only hope about some veiled, shadowy figure that might come in the future, we can look back and see how God was actually faithful already. Habakkuk knew that God would be faithful, but we can look back and see that God was faithful. How he was faithful even in sending his own beloved son to come to earth to live for us, to die for us, 
and to save us from our sin. That is how God shows his faithfulness. And because we can live, uh, because we know that, we can live with that same stubborn, faithful grit that Habakkuk had. We can praise God in the midst of our reckoning because we know that God is faithful. That whatever happens to us today is not God pouring out his wrath on us because we are so full of woe. He's already taken care of that in Christ Jesus. We can live through our reckoning because we know that God is faithful. We can sing like Habakkuk did, but we do so with even a better voice to our faith because we know how God has developed his salvation plan. We can sing as we did this morning when we're in the desert, when all that was within me feels dry. My God is the God who provides. When we are in the trial, when in weakness or trial or pain, there is a faith that is proved of more worth than gold, so refine me, Lord, through the flame. We can say that with that same stubborn grit Habakkuk had because we know that God is faithful. And we can do that whether the Babylonians are on the horizon or not because God's faithfulness does not change. And Jesus cannot be stolen from us. But Habakkuk is also realistic. Because that sounds all well and good, but that seems somewhat divorced from reality, doesn't it? When our life is really falling apart, we don't feel the faithfulness of God often. We know it, but we might not feel it in the heart. And so when you look at verse 18, what does he say? This is not in the English, but I think this is really helpful. He said, Yet I will celebrate in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. In English, this is a statement of fact. But in the original Hebrew, it is actually much more nuanced than that. And the nuance matters because it connects Habakkuk's grit in his faith to our reality lived today. It is in what is called the cohortative. Okay, boo. Uh, It's this idea that it's like a divine encouragement. It's a a piece of grammar. It's a tense in the Hebrew that doesn't exist in English. But it's a way of saying, yes, Lord, this is what I'm doing, but please, Lord, let me do this. It's, yes, I have believed, but please help me in my unbelief. It has that kind of divine wish aspect to it. It's a a form of self-encouragement in prayer to God. That's what that does. And so the prophet here isn't just saying, Lord, give me the strength to go through this. Nor is he just saying, yes, I'm so wonderful, I've got the strength to do it. He's kind of doing both at the same time. And is that not the key to exercising our faith in a difficult period of time? We recognize that it is actually hard to have strong faith in God in this time, and yet we do have faith and we pray that God will give us the faith all at the same time. We acknowledge that the faith and the, and the grit comes from God and yet we say that we have that grit because God has given it to us. It's both things at the t- same time. It's like a, a little, you know, the, the fuel that goes into a little two-stroke engine. It's mixed up of oil and petrol mixed together. The engine will run if you take out the oil but it will eventually burn out and it won't run for very long if you put in just the oil. It actually needs both things to work. That's the kind of combination of faith statement that Habakkuk here is making. He's saying that, yes, this is true of me, and please, Lord, let this be true of me at the same time. You see, we neither trust our own faith in the moment because we're asking God to give us the faith, nor do we ignore our responsibility to have faith we, we do, but we're asking God to give it to us. And that, I think, is the key to living in the crisis, in the reckoning. Because when we do that, when we both acknowledge that this is what we have, this is what we want to have, and that we need God to give it to us, when we live like that, we can, like Habakkuk say, actually, though the fig tree does not blossom, and there's no fruit on the vine, and the olive plantation fails, and the fields produce no crop, 
and the flocks be cut off from the pen and there's no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord with his help, which he supplies, and I'm going to do it, you know, it's that combined picture, and I will shout in exultation to the joy of my salvation, to the God of my salvation. Or perhaps more closely connected to us, though my body is frail and my health is failing and my partner is dying and my business is bankrupt and my children have deserted me and it seems as if even nature itself is against me, yet in the Lord I will rejoice I will give praise to the God of my salvation. Though I am bullied at school, though I am lonely and alone, though I am abused and, and uh, though my enemies will even try to kill me, yet in the Lord I will rejoice with his help. I will give praise to the God of my salvation. Because God indeed has great power. He has remained faithful in using that power to send his son to live and die for us so that whatever happens to us is not our fault. It's not because God is angry at us, it might be our fault. But it's not because we're bearing God's wrath. He's poured that out on Jesus already. But because he is faithful, he has saved us even from our eternal death. And the more we believe that, the more this grit we will have. Because of Jesus, this is really true for us. Let's pray. Lord, we recognize that our ability to, um, I guess, have grit, have sustaining power in the midst of a crisis time, all comes from you and yet we have a responsibility to have faith in that moment as well. Thank you for the example we have here in Habakkuk who points us to our Lord Jesus Christ who lived the perfect life and died the death that we deserved so that we can now live in response to you. Thank you also that we know that even for, uh, for him this was a difficult thing. And that you've given this to us to learn from. That our faith too is not something that we generate in and of ourselves, but that it is something that you give us, even as we seek to express it ourselves. And so now, Lord, in whatever circumstance we find, us in, we pray, uh, find ourselves in, we pray that you will indeed give us this kind of faith, this kind of trust in your faithfulness, to know that whatever comes to us, comes not by chance but by your fatherly hand and that because of that like Habakkuk we too can say though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vine and though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stall yet we too will celebrate in the Lord and rejoice in the God of our salvation. May it be, Lord, that you will be our strength as you make our feet like those of a deer and enable us to walk on the mountain heights. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.